Hello, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Nidhi Sophie Charret. I'm the social worker covering uh, all of Formation Europe, uh, but I'm not your only option, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, as I'm recording this, uh, 21 of October 2014, I myself am a newcomer. Me and my family, we arrived in July 2014, and we were quite excited to be here in Europe and have all these opportunities, uh, with all the opportunities that it presents to us. Um, so I understand and I get that some of you might not feel in the mindset of hearing what I have to say uh, because I am going to be talking about what are some of the possible challenges and issues that comes with a uh, posting in Europe. I'm also going to talk about what is culture shock, uh, what to expect from culture shock. So some of you might think, what is she talking about? Yeah, challenges and issues. This is a posting in Europe for Pete's sakes. This is awesome. Uh, but I still urge you to give me your attention for the next 30 minutes uh, or so. If not for yourself, then perhaps for a family member or friend and colleague that might that are also newcomers. Um, this information uh, may come in handy in the near future. So what I really want you to get out of this presentation is not only what are some of the possible issues and challenges, but also what are some coping strategies that can be put in place uh, and resources that exist to help you cope through these uh, challenges or even prevent some of them. So if we look at more of the general aspects of uh, some of these uh, challenges. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is the sheer volume of administration that comes with such a posting. Before we left, I mean, just the screening process itself can be very overwhelming. Preparing the household as we're posted outside of uh, Canada, a posting um, overseas is much more complicated, I find, um, than a posting within Canada uh, with everything that we need to think about um, and, and prepare for. And then we arrive here and it's more administration that needs to be done. If anything, I think there was more uh, to be done when we arrived than when we left. And on top of that, we also have to help the family adapt and adjust. We're adjusting to a new environment, new language. We're adjusting to a new job because even if you've already um, done this job many years al already, um, a posting in Europe comes with all kinds of twists and turns to this, to our job. So all this added together can become very overwhelming when we first arrive. Also, a posting in Europe is not a three to four years vacation. And um, some people might find that petty, but I've heard and seen uh, many families that struggles a little bit with that because it's sometimes hard to find that balance. I've heard so many people say, you know, if we don't go somewhere a week and we almost feel guilty, we just want to, you know, squeeze it all in. Three to four years, we're told, is going to fly by and it's going to go by so quickly that we want to make sure that we're not missing out on anything. And so finding the balance between regular life, so having to go to work and kids going to school and still having to maintain the household and, and grocery shopping and all that stuff, and then wanting to um, take advantage of all the traveling opportunities and, and just experiencing the culture that Europe presents to us, and just finding that balance can become challenging and difficult sometimes and overwhelming sometimes. Uh, shopping, opening hours of shops, grocery stores, telephone and internet services, they work differently and require adaptation as well. I know that in Germany, uh, getting ca connected uh, for the telephone and the internet takes a lot of time. Uh, and even uh, when you are connected, uh, depending on where you live, the connectivity can be an issue. Even within the household, connectivity, there's connectivity issues. Um, so it becomes difficult when you're used to use those methods to communicate with friends back home through uh, Skype or Facebook. Uh, so all this adds up. The weather uh, in some countries can be uh, an issue. Uh, in places like Germany, Belgium, UK, there's much more precipitation than and for a little amount of sun. So for some people, that can really impact their mood. Um, Crime rates can also be very high in some countries. Uh, the countries that comes to mind uh, right now are Naples and Poland. Those are the places I tend to hear about. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's not an issue in other places as well. But those are things that we have to adjust to. And it certainly adds up to stress levels and, and anxiety for some people. Um, 
there's between five and nine hours of time difference with Canada, uh, which can have an aspect, uh, uh, an impact on several aspects of your life. If you're used to communicating with friends and families when you're going through good moments, uh, low moments, if your coping strategy is to vent with those close friends and families, uh, well, then now you need to plan that a little bit more. And sometimes you wish you could talk to someone right away, but you can't because they're sleeping right now. So that can become challenging as well. Uh, also for work, communicating for Ottawa, for example, uh, can take a whole day before you get an answer back, if not more, because by the time they get your email, it's uh, end of the afternoon for you. Um, and um, by the time the answer back, you'll be home and, and you won't get the answer until you come in the next day. So that too adds again to all those challenges and issues that you might be facing. Uh, serving in Europe as a member of Canadian Forces comes with high expectations uh, because you are the image of Canada. And what that means is that sometimes you might feel that um, chain of commands are a little bit more nosy or in your business uh, more than what you would be used to in Canada. The reasons for that is uh, I tend to notice that chain of commands um, are much more protective of their families here. They know the challenges of adapting to this posting and so they want to make sure that their families are adapting well and are going to be successful in this posting and, and they worry about them a little bit more because of that. Uh, they also worry about the mission because one family not doing so well will have an impact because there's, so, uh, there's not that many of us here and some of you are just one of one in your job so it's going to have an impact on many other things. So they do tend to have uh, or to be a little bit more in your business and that sometimes has its pros but it certainly can has its cons. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the legal aspects of things because that's not my realm of expertise, but all I want to say about that is that just to remind you that all military members are subject to the Code of Services Discipline and families too in some circumstances will be subject to the, service codes of, uh, the Code of Service Discipline. But also you are subject to the laws of the countries you are visiting and the country you are living in. So it is your responsibility to be aware of those laws and to abide by those laws. And, and so that's something that you need to be uh, conscious of and, and, and be responsible and accountable for. Medical and psychosocial aspects of things, uh, the medical services provided by the Kin Armed Forces are limited. So sometimes there's a few specialized services that are required and uh, we'll seek those services uh, in the community if we can't offer them to you. Um, but sometimes that comes with uh, challenges with language. It might be difficult to find something in English, for example, or uh, sometimes there's differences in practice. So they might not have the same standards as we have in Canada. And so we have to take all that into account when looking into those uh, specialized services that, um, that might be required. There's financial aspects to these uh, challenges. Um, the cost of living in Europe is high. So some of you might have lost an income uh, by coming here because your spouse now uh, might be out of a job. So that comes into play. Um, and then also we are paid in Canadian dollars and, and that's transferred into Euro depending on how you set up your uh, your pay and your bank accounts. But there's a bit of a loss there. And also earlier I was talking about how, you know, we, we keep um, mentioning that we want to travel and certainly that's in the back of our mind of most people and it's something we want to take advantage of. But even if you want to travel every single weekend, your bank account might not agree with that plan. So those are all things that need to be considered as well. And there's also a different banking system here. Uh, I know certainly in Germany it's quite different than uh, what we're used to in Canada and that too needs to be, needs some adjustment uh, at the beginning. Um, work aspects uh, need some adjustment as well. Working within NATO uh, can be very challenging. Uh, it's certainly uh, very different. There's different work methods, different cultures, uh, different uh, habits and, and, and different types of strategies are used that uh, we need to adapt to and it can't, it's not always easy. There's differences in language that we have to uh, adapt to as well, different in standard. Um, some of you might also be one of one in your trade, so that can feel isolated sometimes. And like I said before, uh, some dependents uh, have lost uh, their uh, 
their job by coming here or has uh, chosen to, uh, you know, set aside their career by coming to this posting in Europe. So that too needs some adjustment. Even if you've prepared for that and, and it was part of the deal coming here, uh, it doesn't mean that it's not challenging and it doesn't need some adjustment at the beginning. Families, do not neglect the challenges that your children will face. Um, really, uh, the children uh, didn't necessarily want or decide uh, to come here on this posting. And it's like that for any other posting in Canada. Uh, but you might be very excited about this posting in Europe and all the opportunities that it presents. Uh, they might not feel the same way because um, now they've probably lost friends and they have to adapt to a whole new uh, place. And like I said, although they would go through that in Canada as well, there's added challenges because uh, perhaps the uh, community they're living in don't speak their language. So it's going to be that much more uh, hard to um, uh, find friends in the uh, uh, just in, on their street and in the neighborhood they're living in. Also, going to school, uh, it might be very different than what they're used to. The schools back in Canada, uh, they were likely the child or their person that tends to come in and out of that school. Uh, now they're going to be attending a school where everyone else around them also comes in and out. So there's going to be a lot of grieving new friends. So making new friends and then grieving them, uh, grieving um, those friendships as they leave. So um, that's going to be some new adjustment for many of them. Also, perhaps some of your kids uh, lost a little bit of freedom by coming here. For example, if you have a teenager that was used to borrowing the car when they were back home in Canada, perhaps here uh, that's not on the table right now because, well, we need to adjust to how we drive here and, and we don't know the language. What if something happens? So for now, we don't feel that it's very safe for you to borrow the car. Well, that's just a loss of freedom right there. Um, and that's just one example. Uh, of that, but I've heard of um, many uh, teenagers that uh, have that sense of loss of freedom at the beginning when they, they first arrive uh, in Europe. Most schools do not have specialized services for behavioral or learning difficulties. Um, so many of you had screened for that uh, and prepared for that, but maybe some of you, uh, sometimes there's new uh, arising behavioral or learning difficulties, and so you might be faced with that challenge. Or perhaps some of you have children that weren't in school yet, and you're just about to find out if there's going to be some of those challenges in place and how you're going to uh, cope through it. Job opportunities are limited or non-existent for dependents in most countries. Um, so some of you, again, we've said that uh, you've set your career aside and perhaps the uh, strategy was, well, we'll try to find something uh, at a new place of posting. And, and sometimes uh, a lot of people, they find value and, and a sense of accomplishment in having a job, even if it's not um, their dream job or a career job. Um, still, you know, it's their way of, of getting, feeling busy and getting busy, but um, maybe that's not going to be uh, possible and there's going to have to be other ways to uh, keep yourself busy and, and, and feeling accomplished. So that too can be challenging. Um, the support of extended family and friends are limited or zero in many cases. And so the, the risk of isolation is high. And there's no ideal formula. So whether you're a family with young children, older children, whether you're a couple with no children or a single member, you will all go through different challenges and you will all have to figure out a way to cope through those challenges. Marital issues experienced in Europe become more difficult than in Canada, typically, uh, simply because, well, you've lost, a lot of you lost your uh, typical bearings. Uh, your typical coping strategies are not necessarily available here. So, for example, if, um, you know, you tend to be social and, and have friends outside of the relationship so you can have uh, people to vent with and, and, and share other things with and the, other than your partner, then all of a sudden you lost that. Uh, and so your only person you can vent with and, and, and talk to and go to is likely your spouse. And if that person is the person that's frustrating you right now, well, it's, it's becoming a little bit more difficult. It's hard to expand the social network um, when you first are posted to Europe. It's important to, tr to 
try to do that, but at the beginning it's a little bit difficult uh, simply because you might be in an area where there's not that many Canadians around you, um, people around you are not speaking your language, and even if there are Canadians around you, there's that fishbowl effect, so people are a little bit more wary at the beginning and just trying to find their way on uh, how are they going to set their own limits and, and how are they going to socialize, but at the same time make sure that they maintain certain healthy boundaries uh, while doing so. So all this comes into play, especially if there's some uh, marital uh, issues going on. And certainly, communication skills are quite tested uh, in, in those events, so this is a good time to brush up on those communica uh, communication skills and, and put them into practice. A lot of adjustments need to, um, are required, uh, marital adjustments are required during an LCAN. Alcohol uh, and drugs and, and staying within the guidelines, the only thing I want to say about that is um, it is your responsibility and it is very important that you are aware and um, that you get all the information uh, that you need to know what are the guidelines in the in the country that you're um, living in, but also in the country you're visiting. I would advise that the best um, the best strategy is if you're going to have a drink, do not drive. I think that's the best way to go about it. Uh, but in any case, you need to be aware of what are the laws in the country you are uh, you are currently in, whether you're visiting or you're living in it. For example, in uh, Germany, what we've learned is that if you get into an accident, uh, they will likely automatically draw blood to see if you have alcohol in your blood. If you do have alcohol in your blood, um, even if you're below the limit, um, you will be uh, partially held responsible for the accident, even if you're not responsible at all. So that's just for Germany. And so those are the little important details that are important to know. All right, now that we've looked at what are some of the issues, challenges that may come with the posting in Europe, let's talk about what culture shock is. Culture shock is not a diagnosis. It's more of a common term used to describe a feeling of anxiety and disorientation that a person can experience as he, she passes from one culture to another. So the majority of people who are posted from Canada to Europe will experience uh, culture shock at one level or another. So it is useful to recognize what is culture shock, but also that this is a period that, a period that will eventually pass and that there are actions that can help uh, and that there are things extremely useful and positive that can come out of it. What I want to say also about this is that it is a, a period that will eventually pass, but from one person to another, that period can vary. I've heard of people uh, going through a difficult period linked to culture shock, so that stage two that we'll talk about uh, in just a minute, um, they go through that difficult period for about nine months, and I'm not saying that to discourage anyone, uh, actually quite the opposite. Uh, people um, that went through such a long period of adjustment had said to me, if someone had told me that it can last up to nine months, then I wouldn't have been so discouraged when I was in it. Uh, because there's times where, where I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to get past this. I'm never going to you know, get adjusted to me living in Europe, and is this what my three to four years going to be like? Well, no, it's going to pass. You need to be patient, and we're going to talk about how to help, uh, some strategies to put in place um, to help uh, through that um, difficult period. So there are five stages to culture shock. The first stage is the honeymoon period. It's when we first arrive uh, and uh, you know, everything seems to be great and exciting and, oh my God, we're in Europe. And uh, I remember when I first got here, uh, there's a lot of little things that would excite me like that. Uh, one example that comes to mind is I have to, uh, every two weeks, I travel to Belgium, Shape Belgium, and it's a two and a half drive um, to go there and then back that same day. And so the first time I made that drive, um, I'm, I'm going along the, the Audubon or the highway and I'm seeing a sign that says Paris and I got very excited. Oh my God. Um, it just became very real to me that I'm in Europe and 
Paris, it's right there. I could go to Paris. Um, well, <laughs> two and a half drive on that highway uh, after just uh, a couple more times, that novelty has worn off. I can tell you that much. So the honeymoon period is is great, but uh, it doesn't last. And, and, and the novelty of many things wears off as we're settling into our regular life and as we're trying to find uh, some sort of a regular routine in that life in that new life in Europe. So we move on to uh, stage two, and that stage is just exactly that, finding our way, finding our place in all this. It's, it's, it's especially, I find that it's, it's, it's especially more difficult for the spouse that stays at home um, because you know, uh, now that, okay, my spouse is at work, my military spouse is at work, my children are in school, perhaps, okay, what now? What do I, where do I fit in all this? And often we see this happening around October, November-ish, uh, because uh, vacation time is over, summer vacation is over, uh, everyone is settled into school and into work, uh, a routine is starting to settle in, or we're trying to figure out that routine. Um, also, temperature outside, it's, it's becoming uh, grayer, uh, this rain is starting, and, and uh, days are getting shorter, so all this comes into play, and that's where you ask yourself, okay, now what? Where do I fit in all this? What will be my routine in all this? What will be my posting? Uh, what will my posting in Europe look like? And that period of transition and of figuring all this out can be very uncomfortable, disorienting. It can be frustrating, sometimes stressful. Um, so all, those are all the feelings that you may uh, come about, and, and it's normal. Um, also, it can bring uh, marital stress, family tension, and conflict. And all this is normal, it's common, and it takes time, and it will pass. And when it does, you'll find yourself moving on to stage three. And stage three is going back up that, that slope. And it's characterized by getting some understanding of the new culture and, and just feeling a little bit more comfortable in the new culture. It's about living in both cultures, your own, your Canadian culture, and it gets easier to get used to the new culture at the same time and become more familiar with it. Uh, some people will learn some of the language, uh, so they're able to participate more actively uh, in their um, immediate uh, community. Um, people will become more familiar with the environment and, and have a, more, a better sense of direction. Um, they'll also feel less, uh, less lost. Um, some people who integrate uh, can often give very good support to others that are affected by culture shock, so it that that becomes, uh, there's a sense of accomplishment with that. So I've been through it. I know what it is. Now I can help other people that are going through the same thing. Um, and often it initiates an evaluation of our old ways versus some uh, new ways that we've put in place with uh, adapting to this new culture. Stage four is finding our momentum. It's, it's, it's finally finding our place, okay, and I have a routine now, I found my place, I know what I, I want to do, what I need to do, it's finding goals for ourselves, um, it's the person realizing that the new culture has some good and some bad things to offer, uh, the integration is accompanied by a more solid feeling of belonging, uh, the person starts to define him or herself uh, and establish goals of, for living. Uh, and all this happens in different um, time frames. So some people might not even get a honeymoon period at the beginning. Uh, I've had people that came in and, and right from the get-go, it was difficult adaptation and they didn't feel that honeymoon period uh, very much at the beginning. Uh, other people had a very long honeymoon period before they started feeling stage two. So all this happens at uh, various um uh, time frames and, and it's, it varies from one person to another. Uh, those five stages um, is just what typically you might see ahead of you. And the fifth stage is getting going back to Canada. So it's that re-entry shock, it's the reversed culture shock is what we call it. I'm not going to get too much into this because as you're listening to this recording, you're likely a newcomer, so you're still three to four years away from that um, 
um, that stage, uh, but uh, and you'll get to learn a little bit more about it as you're getting near to going back to Canada. All I'll say to, to about it, uh, just to prepare you a little bit, is that I've often heard people say that um, the readjusting to Canada was actually more difficult than when they uh, came to Europe and adjusted to the posting in Europe. And there's many reasons for that, uh, one of which is um, when you come to Europe and you feel homesick, you know in the back of your mind that in three to four years, you will be going back to Canada. But when you go to Canada and you miss your posting in Europe, there's a grieving process there because for most of us, we are very unlikely going to come back to live in Europe. So we have to grieve that period of time in our life. So it's a little bit harder because of that. The other reason that comes to mind is that, um, you know, uh, for a lot of people going back to Canada, uh, there's mixed emotions to it, but certainly there's, uh, for many people, there's this excitement of going back home. We're going back home and then you get to Canada and it doesn't feel like home so much anymore because guess what? By adjusting to your new culture and finding your new ways and, and adapting to uh, those new ways in Europe, you've changed. There's a lot of you that will likely change in, during that three to four years. So now that you're back in Canada and you've changed, um, yeah, at home doesn't feel like home so much anymore. And so there's a lot of readjusting that needs to happen. That can be very frustrating sometimes, especially when, you know, having to readjust to my own home, um, that feeling can, can be uncomfortable. So here are some tips and ideas on how to facilitate that period of transition. Uh, that stage two that can be very uncomfortable. So first of all, stay open-minded. Accepting the new culture is one of the main steps to feel at home in your host country. Try new things. So instead of trying to reproduce your usual environment, um, try new flavors, learn the language, go to places of local cultural events, find a hobby. Go where the, either, whether you go where the locals or NATO community uh, tends to go, or whether you take a course or uh, you go and, and do activities within the, uh, the, your, the community you're living in, um, whatever you choose, the important thing is expand your social network. This is an important strategy uh, that may uh, help you cope through some of the difficult moments uh, of adjusting to your posting. Learn the language. Break that language barrier with your baker, your postal worker, or fruit and vegetable salesperson. They generally will appreciate the efforts made in the foreign language, and this might give you a sense of satisfaction and a sense that you're uh, integrating your new um, environment a little better. Also, find pleasure in the little things. So instead of focusing on the major differences between your country and your host country, try to notice the little details that make your destination unique and interesting. Um, I'll give you an example uh, from me. Uh, when we came uh, to Germany on our house hunting trip, one of the first things we learned about Germany uh, that we were told is that, well, we all know that Sundays all the shops are closed. Um, but on top of that, they said, you know what, the Germans, uh, there's no washing your car, there's no mowing the lawn on Sundays. That's a big no-no uh, in this uh, country, and it's uh, it's frowned upon. Uh, so so you'll be told. They'll come in and, and let you know that that's not uh, culturally accepted. So we thought that was very interesting, and we said, you know what? Fine. We we are we were used to doing uh, these kinds of things on a Sunday uh, back in Canada. We did mow the lawn and went grocery shopping, but we're going to change that habit and we'll use this time to make it our family day. So Sunday will be our family day and we'll go out and we'll do some activities just a family and we'll focus on that. So it's little details like that and, and learning to appreciate those little new details and integrate them into uh, your new uh, way of life. So those are uh, tips and tricks that may help you prevent some of the uh, some of those challenges that comes with adapting to uh, uh, this new posting. Um, but also, you have resources in place to help you through that. So, like I said, I am the only social worker that covers all of Formation Europe. I'm located in Gallenkirchen, Germany. 
Uh, I do go to shape every two weeks, but for any other countries, uh, what we can do is uh, we'll have a phone conversation and we'll look together at what is the services that you're looking for and that you may require. Uh, and then I'll look at, okay, how can we go about uh, finding those resources for you? Uh, if there's any U.S. facilities near where you are, that's the first place I'm going to try to tap into. If that's not possible, we'll look at services in your community and see what we can use there that is in your language and that meets somewhat the standards um, uh, that we have in Canada because we want to make sure that you get quality services. Not to say that it wouldn't be quality, but it's just some, there's some services sometimes that are very different than what we're used to in Canada. If that's not possible, then we'll look at um, how can I provide services by phone or by VTC. Uh, maybe I can even go and visit you if, if that's necessary um, in, in where you're located. So those are all the uh, different things or different options that we'll look at together. Um, what are the services that I can offer? Well, I offer psychosocial services. So what that means is um, short-term therapy, such as couples counseling, um, stress management, uh, work-related stress or family-related stress, minor depression, minor anxiety symptoms. Those are all short-term type of um, therapies I can offer. I also offer more administrative um, services such as if you would be, if you're posted from one outcan posting to another, I would do the, I would conduct the screening, uh, the social work screening for your family. Uh, as someone who's deployed, I'll do the screening for that. Um, if there's a need to be repatriated for Canada because there's issues that um, just cannot be resolved here, then the Tuna Command will get me involved to do an assessment and do recommend, make some recommendations around that. Um, those are the admin services that I can offer. Um, there's a variety of mental health services I can offer as well, such as uh, for major depression or anxiety disorder. Uh, that's just a couple of examples. Again, if it's outside my expertise, then we'll look at what else is available that we can use. I also use services um, for uh, assessment and follow-up for addictions, um, for youth protection, and for family violence and crisis intervention. And about family violence, all I will say about that is we do have a family, crisis, a family crisis team in place, and I'm the chairperson uh, for that uh, team. So what that means is that if you are yourself, you think you're experiencing some family violence within your family, or if you know a friend that might be experiencing that, if you have a colleague, or if as a supervisor you think a subordinate uh, might be experiencing a family violence, whether they might be the perpetrator or or the victim, you can call me, contact me, and together we will figure out what is the next step that needs to be taken, what are the services that we need to tap into, and what do we need to do to help out the affected family and make sure that they get all the services they need to help them through this um, situation. There are other resources, uh, so I've mentioned most, most of them already. Uh, there's some referral that can happen in your host country and civilian clinics. Uh, often I will try to use U.S. military mental health services simply because they're very accessible. There's often some uh, understandings between both countries with regards to access to those services. They're, we know they're often uh, very linked to uh, the type of standards or the type of services we tend to offer in, in Canada. So for all those reasons, that's why we tend to uh, go to them uh, first when we're not able to provide. In some cases, uh, we will use the uh, King Forces Health Services Center in Ottawa. There they have a um, uh, they have a program that is uh, specialized in assessing operational stress injury. So that's one example. So if, for example, I, I do have a member that I, I fear might uh, be um, uh, or I suspect might be uh, symptomatic of possible um, operational stress injury, then we might send them to Ottawa to get a full assessment. And then together with Ottawa, we'll figure out, okay, what are the services that we need to put in place? Can we offer those services here? What can we do to help that member? So that's an option. 
there's the Canadian Forces Member Assistant Program. For those who doesn't know what that is, it's sort of like an EAP program. Um, so it works also here in Canada. You can go on that website that you see right there, and it'll give you phone numbers that you can contact. And what it is is that they'll try to find services within your community. Your community. So where you are located in Europe, they'll try to find services. Um, and it's not just for psychosocial and mental health, but it's also sometimes for financial uh, services uh, or financial counseling, things like that as well. It's for the members and dependents. Um, the thing with that, it's, it will offer you up to six, six to eight sessions, uh, not more than that. Often that's all you might need to help you get some basic counseling and, and get you back on track, so to speak. Um, and if not, then you can always contact me and we can look at uh, what we can do to, to give you further services. But that's certainly an option. And uh, we also have two Padres in Europe. One is located in the UK, that's uh, Lieutenant David Johnsick, and uh, another one, uh, Major Lublink, he's located in Shape, Belgium. So between the two, they share the whole uh, territory. Now I'm mentioning those names and I'm just realizing that both of them are being posted out uh, in APS 2015, so those names might change a little bit by the time you hear um, this recording. But again, if you ever have any questions about the services, you can either go through your chain of command or contact me and I'll make sure that I help you um, connect with those services that you're looking for. So who's eligible uh, uh, to those services and, and how do you contact, make that contact? So any Canadian Armed Forces members and their families are eligible to those services um, and the chain of command as well, more as a consultative um, in a consultative manner, they can sometimes consult me with, with regards to um, concerns that they might have for a member. How about can they uh, direct them to appropriate services, for example, or a good example is the family violence uh, um, example that I gave earlier. So how do you make that contact? You can initiate it by yourself directly by contacted me, contacting me. Uh, you can go through your medical personnel, so sometimes people will talk with their doctor and with the doctor they'll uh, determine that yeah it might be useful to talk to the social worker and the doctor might initiate that contact for you um, and then through your chain of co command that's another way uh, that you can um, contact those services. I get a lot of questions back in Canada here as well about confidentiality so um, this is what I want to say about it. Um, the social workers uh, because of our code of ethics, we are bind by our code of ethics to confidentiality. And what that means is that I can't even tell your chain of command if you're using our services without your written consent. Um, and I want to make that very clear. I'm, I'm obligated by law to keep your, those services uh, confidential. The only time I'm not binded by law and actually law obligates me to break that confidentiality is if I fear that you may be suicidal, homicidal, or if I suspect child abuse in any way. Those are the three times where I will break confidentiality, where I must break confidentiality. Also, you should know that we work in an interdisciplinary team within the medical system. So what that means is that uh, if me and your doctor, for example, need to share some information about your case to make sure that uh, we're, everyone is on the same track and, and we're all working in the same direction, we will share that information without your written consent. That's done uh, automatically. So that's what I have to say about confidentiality. So, in conclusion, um, living in Europe, uh, living and working in Europe is certainly an adventure. And like any adventure, um, it, uh, it presents with positive, negative, and unexpected moments. So a good knowledge of facts, challenges, and issues facilitates the adventure and reduces potential stress. Um, and good preparation avoids also bad surprises and disappointed expectations. So if you or members of your family have difficulty to adjust in your new environment, seek professional help. We're there for that. We can help you either shorten that period of transition that can be uncomfortable or help you find new coping strategies that, will, uh, that you haven't tried yet and that might be a little bit more efficient. 
Um, so certainly use those services in place if you feel you need to. Uh, but like I said, uh, this uncomfortable period, if you go through it, when you go through it, it will pass. You need to be patient with yourself and you need to um, use the, the coping strategies and services that are there for you. Uh, have fun. Enjoy your tour in Europe, but keep in mind that you're not alone and uh, we're here to help you if you need to. You just need to ask. Finally, these, this is my contact information. The best way to get a hold of me is by email. I do tend to travel a lot, and so I always have my BlackBerry with me, and uh, I even on vacation because I'm 101 in Europe, uh, I tend to answer my emails and make sure that, um, especially in a time of crisis, that you will be uh, provided with access to resources as quick as possible. So that's my contact information, and, and please use it. Thank you. And unfortunately, if you do have any questions, because it's, it's not a live session, uh, again, please don't hesitate to contact me, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions or concerns. Thanks again.